in this third seminar dealing with the subject of the religion of Islam, we're going to be dealing with the subject of Allah, who is the God of Islam. Now, we wish to recognize right at the beginning that there are many people, and even many Christians, who have bought into the relativism of the 20th century. It is a form of religious universalism, which teaches that all religions actually worship the same God, just under different names. One illustration that helps often with students to bring this home is when I discuss the idea of God playing musical chairs. Now, you can imagine in heaven that uh, we had a circle of chairs and God is marching around those chairs. And when anyone shouts any name of any God whatsoever, God automatically answers and sits down because we all worship the same God just under different names. So up in heaven, there's this uh, God is circling the chairs, and all of a sudden, someone shouts, Krishna, Krishna, and God sits down. Another one shouts, Jupiter, Zeus, and God sits down. Another one says, Isis, Osiris, and God would sit down. Four, Zeus, Jupiter, Isis, Baal, Moloch, Allah. It doesn't matter what name is used to refer to any kind of deity, Supposedly, God will answer to any name because he really doesn't care what people think about him or by what name they call him. Of course, to anyone who studies the Bible, they recognize that God is very concerned how people should worship him. This is why in the Ten Commandments, the very first thing that God told his people is that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you're not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You're not to make an idol and worship any other God. For the scripture says that God is a jealous God. This is why the God of the Bible will not answer and sit down if you say Baal. Did the prophets of the Old Testament ever say, Oh, well, Baal is just as good as a name for God as Jehovah. Did the apostles in the New Testament say, Oh, it doesn't matter if you use the word Jesus or if you want to talk about Osiris or Isis or Jupiter or Zeus. It doesn't matter. Jesus will answer to any name. No, we learn, of course, in the book of Acts in chapter 4 where the apostle Peter said there is only one name given under heaven whereby men and women can be saved. Bible-believing Christians thus recognize that just because someone has a particular name from God, this name may not, in fact, refer to the true God. After all, who would say that Krishna or Shiva or Brahman or Zeus or some pagan deity of some pagan religion automatically refers to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as revealed in the New Testament? Now, this means that we cannot take for granted that when Muhammad spoke of Allah and said Allah is the true God, he is the only God who exists, that automatically this Allah, whoever Allah is, is one and the same God who revealed himself in the Bible. As a matter of historical record, we must state emphatically that scholarship has demonstrated beyond all doubt that the name Allah was not something that was revealed for the first time in the Quran. It is not a name of some deity that Muhammad was the first one to speak this name. The name Allah was a name of a particular and peculiar Arabian deity part of the worship of the Quraysh tribe and was a name used in the religions of Saudi Arabia long before Muhammad was ever born. For example, Dr. Arthur Jeffrey, who, at least in our estimation and the estimation of many people, was the foremost Western scholar dealing, dealing particularly with the origin, the composition, and the nature of the Quran. He also was a professor of Islamic and Middle East studies at Columbia University in New York City had this to say, and I quote, the name Allah 
as the Quran itself is witness, was well known in pre-Islamic Arabia. Indeed, both it and its feminine form, Alat, and we'll see that's one of the names of the daughters of Allah, are found not infrequently among the Theanthropus names in inscriptions from North Africa. The same thing is pointed out by Dr. Gibb, Professor Gibb in England, whose books published by such places as Oxford University. He stated that the name Allah was never explained in the Quran because it was assumed that his listeners already knew who this Allah was. Actually, the word Allah is a compound Arabic word. That is, two words have been put together to form this one word. The original was al, al, which is the definite article in the Arabic language, which means simply the, and ilah, I-L-A-H. al ilah when it was shortened by its usage, became Allah in terms of the etymology of this word, etymology of it. It is purely an Arabic word. It is not Hebrew. It is not Aramaic. It is not Greek. It is not even Syrian. It's not Egyptian. It is a distinctively Arabic word that was used in the culture and times in which Muhammad lived to refer to an Arabian deity. As such, the name Allah was never found in the Hebrew Old Testament or in the Greek New Testament. I was one time involved in a witness situation with an ambassador from one of the Arab countries in North Africa. And as I sought to share with him the gospel, I mentioned the fact that the name Allah was not a biblical name. And he said, oh, yes, it is. It's, it's in the Bible. And I said, well, where is this name in the Bible? And he said, well, Alleluia. And you see the first part is Allah, then Luya. The trouble is, as I pointed out, the word Alleluia, which is Hebrew, not, Ar- not Arabic, is one word in the Hebrew, and it means praise to Yah, J-A-H, or Yahweh, or Jehovah. Thus, the name of God that is there is the name Jehovah, our Lord, not the name Allah. What he was trying to take was the verb, which means to praise, and to twist it around, and the word Alleluia is not Allah, Yah, but Alleluia, praise to the Lord, and has no reference to Allah whatsoever. And of course, I backed this up with such reference work as the International Bible Standard Encyclopedia and the standard reference works. He then responded that, well, the name Allah is also found in, on the lips of Jesus when on the cross he said, Eli, Eli. And it was at that point he said, well, Jesus was actually saying, Allah, Allah. But again, the Greek New Testament is quoting the Aramaic, not the Arabic. It was quoting from Psalm 22 where Jesus uh, threw, prophetically through the lips of David said, My God, my God, Why? Hast thou forsaken me? It is a long way to go from El to Allah. It cannot be done. As a matter of fact, this is totally the wrong time frame. As we shall demonstrate, the word Allah as a name of a deity before Muhammad took it and used it and revamped it was the name of a pagan deity in Arabia. Now, since the Bible was already completed 600 years before Muhammad began his ministry, that is, the New Testament and the Old Testament had already been written, how could the authors of Scripture, particularly Old Testament authors, who would have lived many thousands of years earlier, use Allah in the sense that it only had after Muhammad was born, after he became his He began his ministry in the year A.D. 610. Obviously, the biblical authors would have not confused Jehovah with Allah or Jesus with Allah any more than they would have confused Jehovah with Baal or Jesus with Zeus or Osiris. It was a pagan name, and this name Allah never crossed the lips of any biblical author. 
Thus, as one of the encyclopedias points out, and I quote, Allah is a proper name applicable to their peculiar God as in Arabia. In quote. This is why the Encyclopedia of Religion states, quote, Allah is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian Baal, in quote. Now, some of you are aware of the fact that the Bible does speak of Baal or Baal, B-A-A-L, and there you have Baal worship, you have the worship of the Babylonian deities, and that worship was condemned. Some of you can think of Elijah on Mount Carmel, where you see the total rejection of the Babylonian god Baal or Baal. Now, due to past experiences in dealing with Muslims and non-Muslims who just say, it, it can't be. You mean the name Allah was in existence before Muhammad? Yes. You, you're trying to say that that was not a name for God? Yes. Muhammad didn't get that name for God out of the Bible? Yes. He got it from pagan religions? Yes. Well, well, how do we know this is true? Let me just quote some of the authorities in terms of this, in terms of the Encyclopedia of Islam, edited by Hutzma. Quote, Allah is found in Arabic inscriptions prior to Islam. Or again, uh, in terms of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Arabs, before the time of Muhammad, accepted and worshipped after a fashion a supreme god called Allah. Or again, the Encyclopedia of Islam, edited by Gid, quote, Allah was known to the pre-Islamic Arabs. He was one of the Meccan deities, end quote. The Encyclopedia of Islam that's edited by Lewis, quote, Allah appears in pre-Islamic poetry. By frequency of usage, Al-Ilah was contracted to Allah, frequently attested to in pre-Islamic poetry. Or again, the Encyclopedia of World Mythology and Legend, quote, the name Allah goes back before Muhammad, end quote. Again, the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, quote, mythology, uh, speaking of the origin of Allah's name, quote, goes back to pre-Muslim times. Allah is not a common name meaning God or a God, and the Muslim must use another word or form if he wishes to indicate any other than his own peculiar deity. Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. This is why Henry Preservant Smith of Harvard University, in his book dealing with Islam, had this to say, quote, Allah was already known by name to the Arabs, in quote. Dr. Kenneth Craig, who is viewed as one of the foremost scholars dealing with the subject of Islamic scholars' uh, studies in our own time, had this to say, quote, The name Allah is also evident in archaeological and literary remains of pre-Islamic Arabia, in quote. I'll give you another uh, a citation, I'm only doing this because I know it's hard for people to understand that that name Allah is not a biblical name for God, it's not a Christian name for God, it's not a Jewish name for God, it's not even a pagan name for the same God as the God referred to in the Bible, but is a distinctive Arabian pagan deity. Dr. William Montgomery Watt, who was professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Edinburgh University, and visiting professor of Islamic studies at the Collège des Français at Georgetown University and the University of Toronto had this to say, quote, In recent years I have become increasingly convinced that for an adequate understanding of the career of Muhammad and the origins of Islam, great importance must be attached to the existence in Mecca of belief in Allah as a high God. In a sense, this is a form of paganism, but it is so different from paganism as commonly understood uh, that it deserves separate treatment, end quote. Caesar Farrar in his book concludes, quote, Thus there is no reason, therefore, to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from the Christians 
and the Jews, end quote. I could go on and on in terms of documentation, quoting from general encyclopedias and dictionaries to specific technical dictionaries dealing with Islam and encyclopedias in Islam, all without hesitation state that the name Allah came from Al-Ilah, which was a name of a peculiar Arabian pagan deity. This god Allah was even an idol that they placed at Mecca to which people prayed five times a day long before Muhammad was ever born. Allah is not a Syriac name for God. It's not a Hebrew name to God. It's not even a Greek or New Testament name for God. It is a distinctively Arabic religious term that in, that in the sense of its historical context refers specifically to a certain religion and the focus of that religion in pre-Islamic Arabia. You see, in Arabia, they had astral religions. As we said in our last lecture dealing with pre-Islamic Arabia, the Sabaean religion was the dominant religion in Arabia at the time Muhammad was born. And the Sabaeans worshipped the sun goddess who was married to the moon god. And as Alfred Quelame points out and many other scholars, the name of the moon god was Allah. Now at last the pieces begin to fall into place. The religion in which Muhammad was raised, the religion in which his family participated, the religion of the Quraysh tribe, according to the documents and the historical record, was that of an astral religion in which they worshipped Allah, the moon god, whose symbol was the crescent moon, hence Islam still has the crescent moon as its symbol. And Allah was married to the sun goddess, and together they produced three daughters, Alat, which is again the feminine form of Allah, but it's Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. These three daughters of Allah were the favorite deities along with Allah and the sun goddess of the Quraysh tribe in which Muhammad was raised. As a matter of fact, Muhammad's father's name was Ab Abdullam or Ab Allah, and his uncle's name was Obi Allah. Both his father and his uncle had Allah as part of their name before Muhammad was ever born. Thus, this shows how before Muhammad, the name Allah, such as Abdullah, was in existence. And this was the religion in which Muhammad was raised the worship of a pantheon of Arabian deities, and one of the high gods was the god Allah, who was married to the sun goddess, and they in turn uh, had produced the three goddesses, Allah, Al-Uzza, and Manat. This is why the Encyclopedia of Mythology and World Religions, and I will now quote, along with Allah, however, they worshipped a host of lesser gods and daughters of Allah, end quote. This is a matter not of religious prejudice or bias. It's not our intent to offend any Muslim. Matter of fact, educated Muslims acknowledge this. I remember one trip to Washington, D.C. I happened to get a taxi a driver who was a Muslim, and those of you who've gone to the capital of our country, nine times out of the ten, you'll get a Muslim cab driver. You usually see them with their prayer beads uh, put that are hanging down from the rearview mirror. But in this case, he didn't have the beads. But as I got in the car and I noticed the Islamic name, and I said, "Hi, oh, where are you from?" He was from Iran. And he said, "Well, what are you what are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm I'm doing a book on Islam. I need to go to the Library of Congress and." I'm doing some research. And he said, well, what are you researching? The history of the name Allah. Did you know where the symbol of the crescent moon came from? Just like that, he said, oh, yes, it was a symbol of ancient pagan religions uh, all over the Middle East, and it was adopted as part of Islam. 
I said, well, did you know that the name Allah was the name of the moon god? He said, oh, yes, it was the name of the moon god. We know that. I said, now, you're admitting that it was the name of the moon god? He said, yeah. And the crescent moon was the symbol? He said, yes. That's why uh, Islam had great success in, in the Middle East because the people were already worshiping the moon. And I said, well, you know, most Muslims will not admit this. He said, oh, well, they won't admit it to Westerners, but they know this is true. I said, well, are you a faithful Muslim? He said, no. Um, I'm a university student, and I'm trying to understand Islam from a scholarly viewpoint, and thus I've lost my faith. I no longer believe in Islam. Well, you see, this taxi driver, this international student, reveals the impact of understanding that in pre-Islamic times, the name Allah, for which Muhammad's father and his uncle uh, were named, the name that was used in connection with one of, the, one of the 360 idols at the Kaaba, at Mecca, that this name was a pagan Arabic deity, the moon god, whose symbol was the crescent moon. And thus Allah is not simply just another name for God. Now, in one time in giving this uh, material, I had a student who objected and said, well, I still believe that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. After all, they only believe in one God. Well, I pointed out that monotheism in and of itself is no guarantee because if you begin with the wrong God, you'll end up with the wrong God. Imagine that someone who was in ancient Greece decided to be a monotheist but to say that Jupiter is the one and only true God. Does this mean that the God of the Bible and Jupiter are the same? Imagine if some ancient pagan worshiper during the days of the Old Testament said, well, I believe that Baal is the only true God. This means that Baal and Jehovah are the same. You see, saying there's only one God does not automatically mean you got the right God that you've singled out. So when the Muslim says, there is only one God. And when the Christian says there is only one God, when the, this does not necessarily imply they're talking about the same one God. What Muhammad did was to take the God of his fathers, Al-Ilah, and to take this pagan religion in which they worshipped Allah by going to the Kaaba and praying toward Mecca, to take this deity and to make him the sole Arabian deity, and the attributes of that Allah cannot be confused with the attributes of God. Over here, for example, and we will have to be brief because we do not have all the time uh, that I wish that we had. For example, in terms of the God of the Bible versus Allah, the God of the Quran, the Bible says that God is knowable. Indeed, Jesus Christ came in order that we might know God. But Allah is unknowable according to the Quran. In the Bible, Jesus defined God as a spirit in John 4:24. God is a spirit, and they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But in the Quran, this would be blasphemous to say that God is a spirit. In the Bible, we talk of God being personal. We have the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in the Quran, God is not a person. To say that God is a person would be blasphemous, according to Orthodox Islam. It would be to, to lower him down. In the Bible, God is a triune God, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Quran denies the Trinity. It says that God is not a Father, Jesus is not a Son, and the Holy Spirit is not part of God. They deny the triune nature of God. In the Bible, God's actions are limited by his nature. For example, he cannot lie. He cannot do that which is in opposition to his nature. But Allah is not limited by anything. In the Bible, because God's actions are limited by his nature and there's things he cannot do, therefore he's consistent and trustworthy but Allah is capricious and untrustworthy. He can do anything he wants. He can change his mind. He doesn't even have to keep his word. In the Bible, Christ is the Savior of helpless sinners, is the second person of the Trinity. But the Quran says there is no Savior 
If you're going to be saved, you must save yourself. In the Bible, the holiness of God, the grace of God, and the love of God are all magnified as his chief attributes. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the grace of God that leads to repentance and the love of God. But when you turn to the Quran, you do not find any real emphasis on the holiness, grace, or love of God. Instead, it's the greatness of Allah, the transcendence of Allah. He is the great and the compassionate one, but he is exalted and lifted up. In the Bible, we can have a personal relationship with God, but in the Quran, no personal relationship is possible. Love to God is the greatest commandment, but you will never find this in the Quran. Submission to Allah is the pillar of Islam. In the Bible, salvation is given by grace alone, but in the Quran, salvation comes by works. Man must save himself. In the Bible, love is the main motive to obey God. In the Quran, fear is the main motive to submit to Allah. When anyone examines the attributes of the God of the Bible with the attributes of the God who is revealed in the Quran, it is immediately recognized that these are two radically conflicting conceptions of God. This is why Muslim and Christian theologians have been fighting for over a thousand years as to who has the true nature of God. Thus, we would state that in terms of an understanding of the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible, these are not one and the same God. They do not have the same nature. They are not the same God. After the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world and the introduction of Christianity. According to the Quran and the Hadith, he was born to the parents of Abdullah and Mina. His father died before he was born and his mother died uh, while he was yet a small child. He was sent first to live with his wealthy grandparents. Then when they found that they could not handle the situation, they sent him to live with his rich uncle. But when that uncle could not deal with it, then he was sent to live with a poor or rather impoverished uncle who did the best that he could in terms of raising this young boy. In terms of the early years of Muhammad, we are told that there wasn't anything remarkable or extraordinary. He was simply a nice Arab boy who loved to go into the desert. He was born in Mecca, but he would leave the city and he would talk to the caravan traders and drivers and he loved to play among the caves. And in terms of his education, his intelligence, his background, there is nothing that is noted that would make him stand out in the crowd. He was just a simple, normal Arab boy growing up in Mecca a member of the Quraysh tribe involved in the worship of the moon god Allah and the three goddesses at the Kaaba in Mecca. But as a young person, he began to have what we would describe in the West as religious experiences. The religious experience that is outstanding, which is recorded by unimpeachable sources, was that on one occasion the young Muhammad claimed that a heavenly being had come down from heaven and had cut him open starting up here near the throat all the way down and had opened him up and then with the stick this heavenly being had stirred his intestines, his insides all around, then sewed him back up. Now this is a story that is told in the Hadith by uh, sources that are absolutely reliable. And of course, we must remember that the Hadith is viewed as inspired and is equally as authoritative as the Quran itself. But even in the Quran itself, in Surah 93 and verse 1, Allah speaking to Muhammad said, Did we not open thy breast for thee? Cut it open? As to the meaning of this early religious experience in which his insides were stirred around, we are not told. Uh, but whatever it meant, it certainly revealed that the young Muhammad was already having religious visitations and experiences long before 
he was ever called to be a prophet and to be an apostle and to be the founder of a new religion. There are also other exciting instances in Muhammad's life as a young man when he had these heavenly or religious visitations or experiences. But as a young man, uh, he began to work in the caravan trade, sitting on his donkey or camel and leading out uh, the animals and being involved in the ways of a merchantman. And he became attached to a widow who was 15 years older than he was. And at the age of 25, he married his first wife. Because he had now married into wealth, uh, he began to accept the life of leisure. As a matter of fact, the only responsibility that Muhammad had after the marriage to his first wife was that of running the family's produce stand in the market there in Mecca. But when he reached the age of 40, then Muhammad had once again a religious experience. And it was this experience which was to alter ultimately the course of religious life in the Middle East and in the world today. We are told that Muhammad received a call in the year 610 in order to become an apostle and a prophet and the founder of a new religion, a religion that would succeed all other religions. It would be the greatest religion of all, one step further in the ladder, as it were, of evolution. And this religion would be the religion in which all men would worship Allah and particularly as he is expressed at the Kaaba in Mecca. Now, it's interesting to point out, as Dr. Montgomery Watt of the Edinburgh University uh, points out, that Muhammad gave four conflicting versions of this call to be an apostle and a prophet. As you turn in the Quran, you will find in one section that Muhammad says that Allah himself came down in the form of a man and Muhammad saw Allah and heard Allah and Allah called him to be his prophet. This was dropped because obviously this uh, was too close to the pagan pantheons in which somehow men were elevated to divinity. Instead, in another section in the Quran, uh, we are told that it was the Holy Spirit who came to Muhammad and called him to be the prophet. But this too was dropped. And instead, in a third section in the Quran, we are told that the angels, that is plural, angels, came down and delivered to Muhammad the call to be the prophet and the apostle of Allah. This too was later dropped. And the fourth explanation of this original call is given in the Quran in which it is stated it was the angel Gabriel who came down to Muhammad who struck him and told him to recite. You must remember that the Islamic concept of revelation and the Arabic word simply means handed down cannot be compared to the Christian concept. In the Christian concept, the biblical authors were inspired to write what they would write so that men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke and they wrote as God moved them and they were the human authors. Thus Matthew wrote Matthew or Isaiah wrote Isaiah, but not so with the Quran. The eighth angel Gabriel brought down the Quran as it was written on a stone table and all Muhammad was to do is to recite what Allah had written so that Muhammad is not viewed as the author of the Quran. Most scholars point out that this last version, which is the one that is generally told to Westerners, was made after Muhammad's controversy with Christians. And when the Christians pointed out that the call of John the Baptist and the call of Jesus, that both of these men in terms of their births were attended by the angel Gabriel, that Muhammad assumed, well, since I'm the next apostle and prophet, it is only appropriate that Gabriel should be the one who should come to me. But we must point out, as Western scholars have pointed out, 
that this fourth version is in conflict with the earlier three versions. Thus, Muhammad received a call to be two things, a prophet and an apostle. Now, in terms of pre-Islamic Arabia, there was no concept of prophethood as we find in the Old Testament. Neither is there a concept or name of the word apostle as found in the New Testament that could be found in pre-Islamic Arabia. Muhammad used these two things in the attempt to draw the Jews in to accept him as the next prophet and then to draw the Christians in who would accept him as the next apostle in the hopes by calling himself prophet and by calling himself apostle he might be able to draw in converts from both religions. In terms of an explanation of this religious experience, be it Allah appearing as a man, or be it the Holy Spirit, or be it angels, or just the angel Gabriel, whatever four, whichever of the four conflicting accounts you, you care to pick, though we must point out one can be true and the other three wrong, or they're all wrong, but they can't all be right, we have to understand how do we interpret that religious experience. Western scholars do not deny that Muhammad had religious experiences. He even had them before his call to be a prophet and apostle. At this point, you see, most Muslims would feel that it's almost blasphemous to look into the subject. But Western scholars have always pointed out that the physical characteristics which accompanied Muhammad's religious experiences sound very much like the problem of epilepsy and an overactive imagination. For example, he would fall to the ground and his body would begin to jerk. This is all the unimpeachable records, the descriptions of his relatives, his family members, his friends, the early Muslims who would not write something against Muhammad, but he would fall to the ground, his body would begin to jerk, he would begin to perspire profusely. They would often cover him with a blanket. And in pre-Islamic society, as in most pagan societies, when someone had the problem of epilepsy or some kind of seizure, when they fell to the ground, they were considered touched. They were either demon-possessed or perhaps they were being visited by the gods. Those of you who are familiar with Greek philosophy will recognize and remember that Socrates, uh, who was the mentor of uh, Plato, was afflicted with the problem of epilepsy, and when he would fall to the ground, he was considered that he was touched by the gods. And he would arise and then begin to tell people what he felt he had experienced during his seizure. In the same way, Muhammad's religious experiences, which started as a child and then grew in terms of intensity and number, in terms of the physical description, sounds very much like epilepsy, and there were only two interpretations of that kind of experience in Muhammad's day. You were either demon-possessed or you were being visited by the gods. At this point, it is essential to point out that Muhammad himself only considered th those two possible explanations. He first considered the point that maybe he was demon-possessed the jinn or the genies, the spirits that inhabited the rocks and the trees and the rivers, we talked about them in a previous session, they had possessed him. This so worried Muhammad that he decided the best thing to do was to commit suicide. But on his way to commit suicide, he fell into another seizure. And it was in this religious experience that Allah communicated to him that he was not demon-possessed, but he indeed had been called to be a prophet and apostle. This prevented Muhammad from committing suicide. But within a short time, he once again fell into depression and discouragement and doubts. He opened up his heart to his wife. She comforted him and said, Muhammad, you are such a good man. It is impossible that you are demon-possessed. Thus, the only other option is that you have had a divine visitation. Even with the encouragement of his wife, Muhammad at times would worry because in the religious experience in which he had grown up with, 
when people fell on the ground and had these fits or seizures, it only meant demonic possession or divine visitation. Western scholars have gone on record at various points stating uh, that we must acknowledge the possibility of epilepsy. Now, I'm aware of the fact that we live in an age of ecumeniacs and we live in an age of of, uh, religious relativism and no one is ever supposed to say anything about anything and we're just supposed to love each other and sort of get all tangled up in some kind of melted marshmallow religion. But you see, scholarship cannot rewrite history just to offend hurting the feelings of someone. Even the concise dictionary, uh, matter of fact, the shorter Encyclopedia of Islam, which is published by Cornell University, and that's hardly to be viewed as some kind of Christian plot or Christian college, points out that the Hadith, and remember, that's viewed as just as inspired as the Quran, the Hadith, it describes, quote, the half abnormal experience static condition with which Muhammad was overcome, end quote. And you see, when Western scholars point out that there is an alternate explanation that what Muhammad was experiencing was not demon possession, it was not divine visitation, he had a medical and mental problem. For example, the McClintock and Strong Cyclopedia states, and I quote, Muhammad was endowed with a nervous constitution and a lively imagination. It was not at all unnatural for him to come after a time to regard himself as actually called of God to build up his people in a new faith. Muhammad, as we gather from the oldest and most trustworthy narratives, was an epileptic and as such was considered to be possessed of evil spirits. At first he believed the sayings, but Gradually, he came to the conclusion, confirmed by his friends, that demons had no power over so pure and pious a man as he was, and he conceived the idea that he was not controlled by evil spirits, but that he was visited by angels, whom he disposed to hallucinations, a vision and an audition, afflicted with the morbid state of body and mind, saw and dreamed, or even while awake, conceived he saw. What seemed to him good and true after such epileptic attacks, he esteemed revelation in which he, at least in the first stage of his pathetic course, firmly believed and which imparted to his pensive variable character the necessary courage and endurance through all mortifications and peril. Now we understand that some people living as they are at the latter end of the 20th century when we want to try so hard to pretend that there are really no differences, that uh, we all worship the same God and God is the Father of all mankind and we are the world and we all want to join the Coke uh, bottle type of uh, advertisements. Yet, scholarship cannot put up with that. It is a matter of historical record that when Muhammad was visited and had a religious experience. We don't deny that he had a religious experience. We just point out that there are more options than simply saying he was demon-possessed or he was indeed visited by uh, Gabriel or Allah. Instead, he could have had a problem that manifested itself early in life with that vision of being split open and his belly open and stirred up in the inside. Where did that come from? Why is this? Thus, Western scholarship cannot simply ignore historical facts or seek to rewrite history in in order to avoid hurting the feelings of those who do not want to hear the facts. The facts are the facts. In terms of his religious background, we saw in our last session that the Quaresh tribe was particularly addicted to the worship of Allah, the moon god, and to the moon goddess, and to the three daughters of Allah, Allah, Al-Uzza and Manat. These three goddesses were the mediators or the go-betweens so that Allah was so exalted, so high, so lifted up that really there was no personal relationship with Allah 
but you went through the three daughters and as you prayed to these three goddesses, they in turn would intercede uh, to Allah on your behalf. This is evidenced by the fact that Muhammad's father and his uncle both had names that involved the name Muhammad itself. Muhammad grew up in Mecca with the Kaaba shrine, which had 360 idols, one of which was the uh, the Allah idol. There was the sacred magical black stone, which was the good luck charm of the Koresh tribe. He witnessed the pilgrims coming to Mecca, running around the Kaaba, kissing the black stone. And it is no surprise to find that he took the religion of his youth, of his family, and he took that religion and it became the very basis, indeed the very pillars of us of Islam today. In terms of Allah's ministry, once he was convinced by his wife that he could be looked upon as a prophet of God, she encouraged him to begin sharing the good news of the new religion, that the Allah that they all had worshipped from the beginning was actually the only God there was, the one, the true, and the only. He began to share this with his family, and his first converts indeed came from his family. Then he began to share it with neighbors and friends, and, and before he knew it, word got out, and he began to be exposed to ridicule. He began to run into difficulty and persecution, and this caused great difficulty for Muhammad because he was, as it were, betraying his own tribe, betraying his own family. His grandparents, for example, never accepted Islam and died pagan. Many members of his family refused to accept him as the prophet and the apostle. At this stage in his own development, he became uh, convinced uh, that there were those who would seek to harm him. As a matter of fact, a siege was laid to the section of Mecca where he lived. No one could go in. No one could come out. There was a problem of food. He became so alarmed that he decided that the only thing he could do was to admit to the Quarish tribe that, yes, you can worship the three goddesses. Thus, according to unimpeachable early sources and according to some of the material in the Quran itself, in meeting certain of the Meccans who were influential, he found out that they were going to worship Allah, Aluza, and Manat, the three daughters of Allah. And he stopped them and said, where are you going? And when they said they were going to worship the goddesses, he said, yes, it is appropriate to go to the goddesses. Are they not the ones who intercede before Allah for us? And they all bowed down together and worshipped Allah. Aluza and Manat. This is what is called the Satanic Verses, the title of the book of Solomon Rushdie. But this is the Satanic verse that is written in the Quran itself. According to the Hadith and the early Muslim writers, Muhammad at that point, because of a weakness, of a lack of courage, was inspired by Satan. And thus he put into the Quran an acknowledgement that is polytheistic, that is pagan, the worship of the three goddesses. This is why in later times, that section of the Quran, that part of the verse, was taken out of the Quran because it was acknowledged by all Muslim authorities that that should have never been put in there because obviously only Satan could have inspired Muhammad to write in there, to put in there, that they should worship the three goddesses. This appeased the Meccans. They reduced the siege. This led to happiness and rejoicing. Everything at last was in order. The trouble is, when his friends at Medina later found out, they came and exhorted him. They rebuked him. He had given up his monotheism. He had lost his principles, his courage. He listened. He was rebuked. Then he claimed after a seizure or religious experience that Gabriel came and rebuked him himself. Thus he announced to one and all, well, you cannot worship the three daughters of Allah. This led to no end of ridicule. 
The people said, look, first you tell us Allah says we cannot worship the three daughters. Then you tell us Allah says we can worship the three daughters. And now you say Allah says we can. Can Allah make up his mind? The persecution became so strong that Muhammad had to leave in fear of his own life. We will have to stop our session at this point and we will pick up in the next session uh, concerning the life of Muhammad, what happened in his life after the problem of the satanic verses versus his fall into polytheism, his reversion back to monotheism, and his flight from Mecca.